Okay, uh, hello everyone and welcome to the Vandenberg Coalition series on the future of conservative foreign policy. In this series, we talk with some of the leading national security strategists on their vision for the future of foreign policy in our community. And this week, we are thrilled to welcome Matt Pottinger, who's former Deputy National Security Advisor and Hoover Senior Fellow, Chairman of the China Program at FDD, and of course, a member of the Vandenberg Coalition's Governance Board. Matt has an incredibly distinguished career of service to our country, not only in government, but also in the United States military, serving in both Afghanistan and Iraq in the US Marines. Matt is rightly credited with leading efforts to address growing threats from China, focus US strategy on great power competition, and combat the COVID-19 crisis. A brilliant mind and writer, Matt has penned a number of insightful pieces on China and other subjects, including in his previous career as a journalist for the Wall Street Journal. And I think it's worth mentioning that in addition to being a vital voice on national security issues, Matt is also a genuinely kind person and delight to work with. Um, so we value those qualities at Vandenberg and encourage our next generation folks uh, to use Matt as an example. Hey, Amanda, hey, it's great to be with you again. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it's, it's, um, I, I, this, this whole series has been really good, <laughs> by the way, I've, I've enjoyed the, uh, the previous podcast that the Vandenberg Coalition's put together. And, uh, you know, it's, it, I think, I think the coalition is, is, is really um, uh, doing a great job of uh, casting or, or pitching a very broad tent <laughs> that's trying to bring in uh, people who understand how important it is for the United States to maintain a, a, uh, a, uh, a very active role in the world and, and not to turn inward and become isolationist. Um, look, I, I, I think it'd be fun just to, to get rolling on questions. So, I mean, if you've got um, questions you want to start with, the audience has questions we want to start with, let's go with where what, what's on your mind. Sure, um, we can dive uh, dive right in. I wanted to start because we have a number, as I mentioned, of our next generation folks on the line. Um, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about how you came to be involved in national security because you have kind of an unusual path um, to the White House and to the National Security Council beginning at the Wall Street Journal as right. a journalist. Um, and so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you became interested in China and in working in foreign policy. Yeah, well, working in foreign policy, I think if there's one thing, you said I was a brilliant writer. That's very nice of you. I don't know if, about that. I am a writer, though. And, and the thing that has been uh, consistent in everything I've done in my adult life, whether it was uh, journalism, uh, uh, serving as a, as a U.S. Marine, as an intelligence officer, um, running my own little business, doing investigative research, and then, and then working at the White House, um, the, the, the glue that uh, sort of binded all of that together was writing. Uh, and uh, I, I guess the, the, the one thing I would recommend is, you know, if for people who are considering a career or, or to eventually go into foreign policy, you don't have to make a career of it. It's fine to go into it uh, from, from other um, uh, sort of vocations and so forth, but, but to constantly be writing um, that'll be the thing that, that differentiates uh, you from, uh, from others. So just writing bravely, <laughs> I think. But, uh, but I became interested in China in high school. I went to, um, uh, in fact, you and I went to the same high school. I, one, one of the, the, the uh, things I, I learned about you when you were working at the White House, we realized that we're, uh, we have the same alma mater. Um, I studied Chinese in high school in the 1980s, which was unusual in the U.S. at that time for them to be offering Chinese. Um, uh, Michael Murray, my first Chinese uh, teacher, uh, inspired me to sort of stick with that. I, I had actually intended to go to China as, a, as an exchange student in high school and uh, got a visa into my passport. And I was really, you know, we were getting ready to go when the Tiananmen massacre took place in 1989. And so, uh, so the, the, they pulled down the trip, but I stuck with the Chinese language study and ended up studying at the University of Massachusetts at Amherst with uh, Don Jertsen and uh, uh, Al Cohen and all these unbelievably great uh, professors. It's really the, the best Chinese language program in New England. At, at UMass. And so I was, uh, had the benefit of that and then doing a year of uh, study abroad. That got me interested in journalism. I went back to China to write for uh, Reuters and the Wall Street Journal um, uh, before I uh, uh, decided to join the Marine Corps in my early 30s. 
Um, yeah, great. Thank, thanks so much. Uh, we did have the same high school English teacher, I think. So uh, he had a big role in some of President Trump's speeches. Little, little did he know. I think. But um, I, uh, I also want to remind our audience to please submit questions again at any time. We expect to get a lot during the session and we'll collect those um, and ask them towards the end. Um, so Matt, you have been, I think, rightly credited with reor reorienting US policy to focus more directly on threats emanating from China. And I was wondering if we could go back a little bit to some of your first days at the National Security Council when you were in the, um, when you were serving as senior director for Asia initially. What steps did you take you know, from day one to try to move the government bureaucracy to focus more on threats uh, in the Indo-Pacific and emanating from China? Yeah, well, I mean, <clears throat> President Trump, when, when he ran in 2016, of course, a big plank in his own platform was the idea that um, we'd gotten a raw deal <laughs> from China, that we'd, we'd been taken advantage of um, in trade, in terms of the uh, theft of our intellectual property, that there were just these gross imbalances and that it seemed as though the United States had been um, showing enormous forbearance, uh, even as uh, this lopsided relationship continued to benefit and build up um, uh, the People's Republic of China and, and to buoy the, the ruling uh, single party dictatorship, the Communist Party of China. And, and it was getting harder and harder to see what the benefit had really been uh, to the American people. And so he ran on that. When, when I, you know, I had the privilege to, to work uh, on the National Security Council staff uh, and to work with uh, an incredible uh, range of people, whether they were, um, you know, detailees, career civil servants who who volunteered to work at the NSC during those years, and and also, uh, you know, we, we were very lucky that uh, that um, HR McMaster uh, came in uh, uh, to drive a national security strategy that um, really persists to this day. Uh, you know, in, until until the Biden administration produces. Uh, uh, a, a successor to it, and I hope that there'll be a strong strand of continuity between those those national security strategies. But um, we wanted to look at uh, putting a framework in place that would help us think not just in terms of the fact that we're being taken advantage of, but also uh, to sort of uh, delineate the 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 uh, the parameters of this competition that we're in. And so the 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 terminology we chose with Nadia Shadlow writing. The, uh, who was just, just did a podcast with you, um, uh, writing about great power competition as really the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the major um, underlying current of um, uh, national security and foreign policy for, for the foreseeable future. And of course, that's only <laughs> proven to be the case when you have things like uh, Russia backed by China uh, launching a war in Europe, uh, like, like we're seeing now in Ukraine. Um, we're, we, we are in um, the midst of a great power competition. I would argue that that we're really in a second Cold War as well. Um, and um, we, we didn't uh, lay it out in those terms. Uh, maybe we weren't ready to lay them at, it out in those terms uh, four or five years ago. Uh, today, I certainly think that it's clear that a Cold War has been foisted upon us. It's not something we chose or wanted to have, uh, but um, Beijing and, and uh, you know, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin get, get a vote in, in the nature of the competition we're in. And it's, it's really a second Cold War that's been inaugurated by a hot war uh, in Ukraine. Yes, and I want to get to um, this point about a new Cold War uh, in, in just a moment. Um, but I did want to pick up on uh, one, one of your comments in a recent Wall Street Journal interview uh, you did, and you had said that uh, President Trump's statecraft, as idiosyncratic as it was, was a lot more sophisticated than either the press or uh, even American adversaries really understood. So you described it as close and respectful diplomacy at the top, but also a willingness to, for me, his counterparts in the groin. And I'm Wondering if you could apply that maybe to North Korea policy, because I think that's an area of, of great interest perhaps to our audience um, or to folks in the foreign policy community, because we saw at times a, a pretty tough line on North Korea, you know, fire and fury, um, the speech he gave in South Korea in 2017, um, which was kind of in, uh, you know, Churchillian Iron Curtain speech, highlighting some of the evils of the North Korean regime. Um, and then we saw the, the diplomatic summits later on. So, 
I was wondering if you might um, tell our audience a little bit about how the president applied that kind of approach to North Korea, if you think that was an example of where he was balancing these interests. Sure. I, I, I mean, North Korea is a pretty good, um, uh, pretty good place to start, right? Because we, it, it was another example of a foreign policy where we had been, we had been pursuing a similar approach for decades. Um, it was really during the Reagan administration that we first became aware of the, uh, the likelihood of some kind of a nuclear weapons program uh, in North Korea. Um, President George H.W. Bush, um, Bush Sr., in his administration, uh, was the first to engage in some diplomacy with the North and, and to try to come to some understanding um, in order to gain access by IAEA you know, investigators and, and to provide um, uh, some, some diplomatic concessions in return for access uh, and, and in return for a commitment from the North not to, um, uh, to pursue that kind of a program. And that, that pattern then repeated itself over the course of the the, the Clinton administration, uh, uh, George W. Bush's administration, uh, the Obama administration. <coughs> and of course, um, North Korea turned it into a playbook <laughs> where they would, they would um, use brinksmanship, nuclear brinksmanship uh, to bring us to the table, um, in some cases, bring us close to the edge of war, uh, and then to extract concessions, diplomatic and economic uh, concessions from the United States uh, in return for a promise not to uh, deepen uh, their, their nuclear program or their, or their missile programs. And then they would, they would rinse and repeat and use this over and over again. And over time, they, they, they made enormous strides uh, in, their, in their program. So when President Trump came into office, you remember that President Obama had, had famously told him, this is the, the crisis that you're really inheriting. This is the thing that's on your, on your plate. Um, President Trump asked us to do a policy review where we would look at the full range of potential options, everything from war to capitulation and, and, and a lot of different flavors in between. And what he, he chose was a maximum pressure campaign um, that left open room for high level diplomacy. Now, this, is, this was actually different than uh, what we'd seen in the past because we, we didn't use piecemeal sanctions. Every time North Korea would test a new um, rocket or, or test a nuke, we would use our um, weight at the United Nations Security Council. Uh, our ambassador, Nikki Haley, did an amazing job of, of shepherding through these uh, UNSCRs. Security Council resolutions that would impose deeper and deeper economic, broader uh, based economic sanctions on North Korea until we had really shut down their ability to generate cash. Um, we even got China for the first time to, to start restricting the flow of oil uh, that it provides to North Korea. So that was the first time that we, we didn't do piecemeal sanctions. We went all in uh, to start um, undermining uh, their economy and their ability to resource those uh, weapons programs, those WMD programs. But President Trump, the, the, the other thing that was new was that he was willing to negotiate directly with this, uh, with this dictator, uh, uh, Kim Jong-un. And of course, there was a lot of criticism, people saying, well, that's, that's a major concession uh, that you're giving him by, by giving him FaceTime. But President Trump's view was that in that kind of a system, there's only one person who can make decisions anyway, and it's, it happens to be this kid in his 30s or whatever, you know, the, the, uh, the, the, the Kim family regime, uh, the third guy in, in, the, in the succession of this strange monarchy. And he said, let's deal with him. I'm not going to send a, another fleet of uh, State Department mid-level officials to go make their careers and become foggy-bottomed angels, uh, uh, you know, spending years and years negotiating uh, crappy, um, uh, unenforceable agreements, which is what had happened for 30 years. So, so he, he ended up engaging directly with Kim Jong-un. And in doing so, he did not give up the pressure of of those uh, sanctions. So it was a different paradigm. I think it I think it did buy us um, quiet <laughs> for a period uh, from from the beginning of 2018 up until really the, the last couple of weeks. Uh, we didn't see nuclear tests or tests of long range missiles. Um, Kim is now dusting off the old playbook um, and is is watching the I think the Biden administration's 
um, appeasement of the Ayatollah in Iran and is saying, well, I want to get, get in on that. If they're going to, if they're going to, if they're going to help make the Ayatollah rich again, make Iran great again, uh, because he's threatening to, to eventually uh, develop nukes. Well, geez, I've already got some nukes. I've already got missiles. I'm going to get in on that game. I'm going to, I'm going to dust off the old playbook, start doing the, the whole uh, nuclear brinksmanship game again in order to extract concessions, because that's his measure of the Biden administration is that they are going to give concessions. They're in that kind of a mode right now, as we've seen in Venezuela and Iran. Yeah, thank you. Um, that's that's fascinating. And you you had mentioned this new Cold War um, in a previous uh, previous answer, and also in, in other interviews you have done. Um, I'm wonder, wondering if we could turn a little bit to this growing China-Russia axis. Um, how would you characterize their relationship today um, and uh, maybe in a moment, we could delve into some of the arguments that say maybe the United States should try to divide uh, Russia from China. Is that even feasible? How would we do that? Is that uh, not a fruitful uh, possible policy avenue and, and why not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, it's, a worthy, uh, it, it's a worthy objective to try to drive a wedge between uh, Xi Jinping and, and Vladimir Putin, but at this point they're basically Siamese twins. You, you're not going to be able to to pull those guys apart. This is a, this is a 10 year effort to stitch themselves to one another, driven primarily by Xi Jinping personally uh, to make Vladimir Putin his junior partner in a new axis. Um, and so the the time for driving that wedge would have been you know a decade ago. Um, it, it, the, if we want to ultimately drive China and Russia apart, and there are many reasons why they are. Um, uh, strange bedfellows, right? This is not a natural alliance in many respects. <clears throat> it's a top-down, um, uh, leader-to-leader, personality-driven um, uh, sort of pact. Um, what you need to do is lash them closer and closer together and, and let them live with the consequences of, of each other's actions, hold each of them accountable for the actions of the other. That's the way that you ultimately will create uh, the space uh, to, to drive those two apart. Uh, and it may have to wait until they, those two men actually leave the scene. Uh, this is a real pact. It's, 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 not, it's not a natural state to state pact. It is a top driven, uh, top down pact, but nonetheless, it's a pact. It's something that we need to deal with. China is now really underwriting, uh, providing uh, all sorts of propaganda and international interference and top cover for Russia's war in Europe. We now know from President Biden's um, uh, call with, uh, you know, video call with Xi Jinping uh, a week ago that China is considering providing financial and even military material support to, um, uh, to uh, Russia to per- prosecute this war. I, I commend the, uh, the Biden administration, President Biden, for, for calling that out, for using uh, intelligence uh, and making intelligence public. You, I think that they've been uh, right in the way that they've done that in the lead up to the invasion and also in sort of calling out China and saying, look, we know all, we know what you're doing. We know what you're considering. We know about the shopping lists for weapons and things that uh, Vladimir Putin's coming to you with. We will know if you provide this kind of material uh, support. I think I think that the Biden administration is, is handling that correctly. Uh, I, in the end, I suspect Xi Jinping won't be able to help himself. He's an ideologue. He, he's already gone all in on this approach. And, and he's going to be badly damaged by the failure of Vladimir Putin in Ukraine. So I think he's going to do whatever he can to help try to turn around the very negative uh, trajectory of, of the war and, and try to, to, to get momentum behind uh, the Russian effort again. Uh, we've got to make sure that he fails and fails spectacularly and that both uh, China and Russia are held accountable. Yeah, you mentioned um, briefly the role of ideology. I'm wondering if we could stay on that point for for a bit. I know you're familiar, as I mentioned, with Winston Churchill's Iron Curtain speech um, in Missouri, in which he laid out sort of the dangers of the Soviet system to the West, both you know Putin's regime and um, China today have oppressive political systems. What is the role of ideology in this new Cold War? And um, do U.S. leaders need to be more forward-leaning on um, the role of ideology and the threat of these systems to the American way of life? Yeah. Well, there, there are differences between the first and second Cold Wars. And it, you know, to paraphrase the historian Neil Ferguson, who says there were differences between the first and second World Wars as well. 
but the similarities overshadow the differences. That's, that's the case now as well. Um, <clears throat> if you listen to, to Xi Jinping, who has been waging a, a cold war since his first couple of days in office, uh, when he gave that secret speech where he basically decried the collapse of the Soviet Union as a catastrophe, uh, said that there are major lessons that China needs to study to avoid the same outcome, uh, to, to not uh, uh, engage in the sort of what he calls historical nihilism that he accuses Khrushchev of having committed by criticizing Stalin. Um, so uh, so the, first we have to understand and accept that, that if we listen to the Chinese leader in his own words, it is quite obvious that, that ideology is first and foremost in his mind in this competition. Second, in, in, a nev, in a second address he gave, which was probably, which is the closest thing to his inaugural address, it was kept secret for six years, but he spoke to the Central Committee of the Communist Party and basically said, um, uh, communism is still the goal. Uh, it, 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 you know, Mar Marx and Engels were still right that capitalism is inherently, uh, you know, has these inherent contradictions that are going to that are going to collapse capitalism and socialism, as, as in the Chinese totalitarian brand of socialism, will ultimately prevail uh, in the world. And that is the nature of the competition that I'm laying out in my first major major speech uh, as leader of China. That was a decade ago. Um, so, uh, so ideology, whether we like it or not, is is front and center in the mind of of the Chinese leader, and he has uh, found ways to have a mind meld with uh, the former KGB officer who's now uh, launched a war in Europe, Vladimir Putin. There are differences in their worldviews, but there are also there's enough similarity and there's enough common language between them. Both of them having grown up. Uh, in uh, intelligence uh, families during a communist era, you know, Putin was a KGB officer and then became head of the FSB. Uh, 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 Xi Jinping was the son of an intelligence officer who, who ran covert uh, influence and espionage activities behind enemy lines during the Chinese Civil War. These guys, these guys have a lot in common. And, and Xi Jinping's even said as much directly <laughs> that, that this is really his uh, sort of this, his, his uh, ideological soulmate. Um, so what are some of the differences, right? This isn't exactly just, you know, about democracy versus autocracy, in part because we actually are, are partnered with some uh, systems, monarchies, uh, some systems that, that have autocratic features, but who are nonetheless important and valuable partners for the United States in the Middle East. Uh, I'm, you know, Vietnam, for example, uh, uh, which, which um, does not threaten us uh, with a global uh, uh, sort of totalitarian uh, 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 ambition the way that China does, and in fact, uh, is quite nervous about the, uh, China's rise. And by the way, has a lot of experience defeating the Chinese uh, over the centuries in war after war after war. So there's a lot we, we can uh, do together with Vietnam. Uh, so it's not as crystal clear and cut as democracy versus socialism, um, but certainly it, it is about you know, I, I was rereading um, uh, President Eisenhower's farewell address uh, when, when he left in 1961, and, and he said, uh, uh, quote, we, we face a hostile ideology, global in scope, atheistic in character, ruthless in pur purpose, and insidious in method. Um, so, that, so it's a subset of autocracies that really are our adversaries here. It's, it's Xi Jinping's China, it, it is Vladimir Putin's Russia, which is, which is to say it's really just those, those men and their regimes, not the countries uh, themselves, but it's also the Ayatollah uh, and, and some of the uh, supporting, supporting actors um, uh, out there as well. I would include North Korea, of course, um, uh, among that count. But we, we, need, we need to sort of uh, adapt the Cold War model because we can benefit from it. I, I, I don't think I need to remind listeners that we won the Cold War, right? So, you know, why not, uh, why not look at our playbook, uh, adapt it, update it, uh, and, and use it? Because the Cold War has already been declared against us. Uh, we, we might as well uh, get onto the, onto the field and uh, start playing ball. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I have one follow-up on, on your answer related to um, this question of reading documents and speeches in their original language. How much are we missing 
um, in the United States government because we don't have, uh, my assumption is that we don't have enough people doing that and that we are missing um, certain aspects of intelligence because folks, we don't have as many people, as many young people maybe trained in these languages. Do we need to revamp some of our critical language education? Um, and are we, are we missing things? What, what is the role of journalists who maybe know these languages yeah. as well working in these countries? Well, look, there, there, there are a lot of great journalists, American journalists who've, who've been covering China over the years. Most of them have been kicked out of China. Um, uh, it, it's, getting, it's getting harder to access that country. Um, uh, our intelligence community has never, well, I won't say never, in recent years has not had a, a, um, um, a serviceable and, and value-added open source um, uh, sort of mission and capability. Uh, I don't think the, the IC is going to do it on its own. I think we need to build an open source um, uh, intelligence capability separate from the IC. I think it needs to be, um, what I would do is, is create a uh, federally funded research and development center. Just give it a 10-year mission. Uh, after 10 years, it goes away. By then, you would hope that the IC itself will have in uh, uh, taken on a lot of the, the functions, but right now you have to build it separate from the IC, just like you have to build a charter school. <laughs> the, the public school isn't going to fix itself. You got to build a charter school and then hope that, that some of the practices bleed over into the public uh, education system. It's the same thing with the IC. We, we, they've done uh, amazing work on um, uh, tactical and operational and sometimes strategic intelligence, like we've seen some real successes in this current conflict this year uh, with respect to Ukraine. But but I, I would fill up an FFRDC with a bunch of retired investigative journalists and have them be asked questions by the executive branch. Uh, don't classify the answers. You can make them uh, for official use only, but, but after a period of maximum four years, they wouldn't even be FOUO anymore. They'd be available to scholars and to journalists and, and to the public, uh, maybe even a shorter time fuse on that. And have them uh, act as a sort of a red team using open source information, I think they're going to get the big questions right more frequently than the intelligence community has gotten big strategic questions right. Because 90 plus percent of what we need is in the open realm. It's, da it's, it's data aggregation and analysis, but it's also qualitative deep dive sorts of investigative reporting, which is not what we really... Um, uh, uh, incentivize our intelligence analysts uh, to do. They, they focus mainly on exquisite uh, 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 classified streams of information, which doesn't mean that it's more reliable just because it's classified. It just means that the sources and means we use to acquire it were extremely sensitive. So, um, uh, the, and, and I would be looking at the speeches and making public immediately the translations and analyses of every speech by uh, major leaders of, of adversary states. Vladimir Putin, we now know, laid out his whole plan, you know, in Munich years ago. Um, Xi Jinping, I would argue, has made his plans very, very clear as well. It includes a war. He's setting the table to go to war uh, against Taiwan. And, and he's, he's laid it all out. We, we, just, we just need to actually read what he says. Um, thank you. Yeah, it sounds like a number of great ideas in there. I hope uh, hope people will listen to some of your proposals. Before we turn to questions from the audience, I wanted to briefly spend some time on some of the debates within the conservative foreign policy community related to uh, the U.S. approach to uh, China, specifically this debate between the group being called, you know, Asia Firsters and um, others who maybe promote a more global role for U.S. engagement. Um, what, what is your sense of the current state of this debate before we get into some of the particulars? Yeah, well, I, I mean, in, in, to, to give credit to people who might um, call themselves Asia firsters, if that's the term that they would use, uh, you know, those, those who are basically focused on China as the primary adversary, they're right about that. Those who view a, uh, a war to annex Taiwan as being something that would be catastrophic for the interests of the United States and for uh, the interests of uh, free countries in Asia and beyond. Absolutely true. <laughs> the fact that we need to prioritize a lot of our, our, um, our military and, and other material and resources and intellectual energy towards that problem, yes. But what the Ukraine war uh, crystallizes, for at least in my mind, 
is, is the reality that this is a global competition. It's, it's a Cold War, it, global in scope, just like the one that Eisenhower was describing in 1961. And, and the fact that China is now underwriting a war in Europe tells us everything that we need to know about how important it is for us uh, to uh, be able to, and we are able to, because there's, there's, a, there's a encouraging lesson that's come out of Ukraine uh, about this as well, but how, how we need to be able to um, uh, deal with and contend with this threat in every region and against those regional uh, bad actors who are increasingly coordinated with one another and increasingly supported by Beijing. Look at how the, the West has come together and been galvanized by the war in Europe uh, uh, to, to such an extent that we are kind of rediscovering how powerful we really are, how powerful our finance is, how, how much more advanced we are in our technology, how much uh, more strength we have by virtue of the fact that we're democracies with rule of law, those of us that are allies uh, in NATO, uh, for example. So these are things that it should encourage us and, and help us feel our own oats again uh, to realize that we can take on the Ayatollah, we can take on Vladimir Putin, and we can take on Beijing and win decisively. But we can't, we can't say, geez, I, I'm going to try to keep Iran out of my inbox by, by giving them everything they need. We're going we're gonna to get rid of our sanctions. We're going to return to an even crappier version of an already crappy deal that was done in 2015 and, and just hope it stays out of our inbox. That is crazy. It is completely a, a cognitive trap, a cognition trap that, that the Biden administration is stepping into by trying to pivot away from Iran. They're making a war in the Middle East more likely, not less likely. They should be pulling our friends and partners in that region closer, riding on and building on the Abraham Accords, which actually are our are, are ticket to ultimately not having to devote as much uh, military uh, attention to that region, not, not going in and trying to deal with uh, the Ayatollah, who, who from what I'm told doesn't even take our meetings. We're using the Russians and other go-betweens to negotiate. This shows a profound lack of self-respect for the United States. People who are negotiating on those terms, representing the United States, I resent them, uh, quite frankly. So we, this is what we need to really understand. You cannot pivot away from the Middle East and expect that that's just going to go away. Uh, so we can do them all. We can do all these things at once. It means that we've got to increase uh, our, um, uh, our uh, um, expenditures on defense. Um, we can talk a little bit more about that. Um, yes, yeah, sure. I was going to follow up on, on that particular point because um, one of the arguments the so-called Asia Firsters make is that this all sounds great in theory, but in practice, the United States just doesn't have the military capacity to fight and win decisively in two theaters at the same time. And therefore, the Indo-Pacific is the most important theater, and that's where the United States should focus. So what, um, what kinds of steps does you, is first, is, is that true in your view? And second, um, what kinds of steps do we need to be taking right now to ensure that uh, that is not the case and we have the capacity to uh, defend U.S. interests in, in two yeah. theaters? And so so I, I saw the, the, the forum for American leadership just came out with some uh, with a very good paper, just a handful of pages, basically laying out some principles that they think uh, the Biden administration would do well to, to uh, keep in mind as it uh, goes back to the drawing board, I hope, uh, and starts over again on a national security strategy that takes into account the second Cold War that we're in. One of the things that they recommended was an annual increase of 5% above inflation for defense spending. I think that is um, a, a minimum uh, kind of expenditure. I, I, would, I would look at uh, seven plus percent uh, per annum above inflation in terms of defense increases. That, by the way, would be keeping pace with China's increases. We keep saying that China is our pacing threat. That if, if it's really our pacing threat, why are we letting them outspend us in, in defense uh, uh, increases? Um, so seven percent would would double our defense spending in, in roughly a decade. Uh, I, I think that that is a a, a, a modest goal uh, for for us to aspire to. That still doesn't solve the problem of the here and now with, with respect to the threat to Taiwan. I do think that we need to be stockpiling arms for ourselves, ammunition, and for Taiwan and for other allies in the Western Pacific, including Japan and Australia and, and others, um, uh, to deter uh, Xi Jinping, 
uh, and, and, and if necessary, to be able to fight and win um, a uh, war of aggression against Taiwan. Um, great. Thanks so much, Matt. And now we have a, a number of audience questions coming in, so I'm going to ask a few of those. Um, David is asking, in recent years, many European allies and partners of the United States did not express significant concern about the malign influence of the CCP. How do you see the attitude of those allies and partners shifting, particularly in light of China's recent behavior toward Russia? So the role of allies and partners in their changing attitudes. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I mean, look at Germany, for example. Example: Germany has had a, a non-strategic, illiberal, corporatist approach to China for a quarter century. Um, uh, that has been self-defeating, and and you're now seeing uh, with with uh, Angela Merkel leaving the stage, uh, her successor in, in a different party with a very different coalition, uh, with uh, Chancellor uh, Schultz now in charge in, in Germany. You, you, you've seen them now call an emergency meeting on a weekend for the first time, uh, announcing a, a massive uh, increase in spending on defense, uh, moving to, to buy you know, fifth generation fighters from the United States, um, uh, uh, putting a floor at 2% uh, of uh, their GDP uh, uh, for defense spending in place. These are, this is really encouraging. This is, this shows you what a, what a grave miscalculation Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin made in trying to launch a war in Europe, believing that they would split Europe, uh, into fragments. In fact, what they've done is they've, uh, they've hardened Europe, uh, into something more like a, a diamond again. Uh, this is, this is, this should encourage people. This is real. This is real stuff that's happening. I mean, um, so the role of allies, um, I think what we're rediscovering is the strength of, of our alliances uh, in the Western Pacific, as well as uh, um, in, in Europe. Uh, the Biden administration will ultimately uh, rediscover the importance of our alliances in the Middle East, our partnerships there as well, I'm confident, um, uh, even after it uh, will make a very unfortunate mistake with a, with a deal with Iran. Uh, ultimately, um, uh, strategy will trump um, the, the politics that drove that very uh, 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 problematic and self-defeating uh, diplomacy with Iran. Uh, so even that's going to shake out uh, in the right way, ultimately, uh, later on Biden's watch or uh, with one of his successors, his next successor, frankly. But um, so... Look, we we are we want to work. What we share in common with the, the our allies is the rule of law, uh, respect for the idea of sovereignty of nations. Most of our partners and allies are democracies. Not all of them. That's okay. We're not we're not trying to force our our system of government or way of life onto our partners. Uh, we're not even trying to force it onto our adversaries. What we're doing is protecting the sanctity of a country's ability to determine their own path for themselves, uh, protecting the, the uh, sanctity of national sovereignty and independence uh, so that uh, we're not invaded and our cities aren't decimated by, uh, by uh, you know, some dictator, uh, and, and that our politics are not interfered in in a way that, that um, uh, erode our sovereignty. So that's the common denominator. That's the common denominator for us. It, it doesn't, it's not always um, a full liberal democracy that's the common denominator in this coalition that we're building. The common denominator, we know what it is for the other guys, right? It, it's it's personality-driven um, uh, dictatorship. It's it's the idea, it's it's there, it's the fear that they all share of color revolutions. Uh, I mean, it, which which for them is a catch-all phrase for any kind of um, uh, people-driven, citizen-centric governance or, or movement towards a more democratic um, uh, way of living. Uh, that's what gives them the night sweats. That's what keeps them up at night. It's what gets them to pull each other closer and to decimate cities and to bomb children's hospitals. Because at the end of the day, all of those guys, what they have in common, the Ayatollah, Kim Jong-un, Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping is they're scared to death of their own people. So we should have a lot of confidence that we're gonna prevail over, over people um, with that worldview. Yeah, thank you. Another uh, question coming from the audience. Uh, the US private sector is critical to American competitiveness and our national security, yet the private sector also fuels 
uh, China's growth, high tech industries, and even military modernization through capital flows. And Matt, I know you've um, you know, you've been writing on this before. Uh, so the question says you were instrumental in helping take, take, uh, helping take steps to address this. Going forward, how should we approach this challenge from a policy perspective is the question. Sorry, the sound went out for a second. Which, which challenge did you say? Uh, the challenge of uh, the role of the U.S. private sector in fueling, oh. you know, China's growth, military modernization. How should the United States address that yeah. from a policy perspective? I, I've got Eisenhower on the brain uh, this morning <laughs> just because I had reread re his speech recently. He talks about this. He talks about, remember, he warns us about uh, the undue influence of the military industrial complex. And, and one of the things he, he talks about in, 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 in dealing with that, because he, he doesn't say we have to we have to spend less or we, we need to. Um, he, he says, look, this is a fact. We're in this this existential competition, but we don't want the military industrial complex to, to be the thing that that drives uh, our politics and our policy or that begins to erode democracy. And the answer to an erosion of democracy is is often more democracy. It is the idea that you bring in the private sector, you try to balance out. Uh, public sector initiatives with more private sector involvement. That's what he calls for in his speech. By the way, he doesn't limit that in his speech, his farewell address. He doesn't limit it to um, <coughs> the military industrial complex. He also talks about a scientific elite, scientific establishment, government run elite that um, has undue influence over all science, all scientists. Um, uh, that was pretty prescient because I think we're facing that problem right now. We, we, we basically designed our scientific basic research establishment like it's a Politburo where you have a couple of grand eminences in, in white lab coats who control the fate of, of all, indiv all independent researchers at universities or tinkers in their garages or, or people uh, who work in more full-time roles with government. They all depend on, on that lifeline of money in ways that have actually uh, undermined um, a, a more pluralistic and competitive uh, 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 sort of uh, assessment of problems. I'm thinking of COVID, for example, uh, and, and COVID origins as, as one example of that. Um, one of the ways to fix that is, is to actually empower the private sector more, have, have you know, have, have more competing centers that are doling out grants rather than just having it all go up to one pope at the top. Um, you know, this isn't, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're not building a, a church here. We're, we're, we're trying to, uh, to actually have a competition of ideas. And the thing that, the thing that w w when we succeed, it's almost always because of the, the miraculous role of the private sector. So uh, you, you think we would have learned that by now. Um, uh, you know, the, the things that we did right on COVID, like Operation Warp Speed, that was about a public-private partnership helping empower uh, private um, uh, researchers and so forth. So we should have the same approach to science generally. Um, and, and we should also uh, probably inject a, a, a lot more of that into our military industrial complex as well, so that smaller players um, uh, have the ability to compete uh, for contracts uh, and not just a few so-called prime, um, you know, giant uh, uh, contractors. Yeah, thank you, Matt. I'm glad you touched on some of the COVID-related issues. We didn't have as much time to get into that uh, in the interview, but I'd encourage our audience to look at some of uh, Matt's previous comments on some of the perverse incentives in the CDC uh, during COVID and his interview, I think was 60 Minutes, which gets into some of that as well, um, if you're interested. So uh, another question from the audience uh, is if Ukraine is analogous to the Korean War, why aren't we putting boots on the ground and galvanizing NATO to act? In a word, nukes. So, um, so one of the dangers of, of this current war um, is that it's becoming an advertisement in, in, in both defensive and offensive terms for acquiring nuclear weapons. Ukraine had given up its nuclear weapons capability at the end of the Cold War. Uh, had they maintained their nukes, it's hard to know, but th th there's probably uh, less of a chance that, that uh, uh, Putin would have uh, uh, you know, launched an invasion. Uh, or at least it, it's it's fair to to assume that a lot of countries will perceive that to be the case, and that becomes sort of an argument in favor of acquiring nuclear weapons. And then on on the offensive side, um, Vladimir Putin clearly feels safe 
um, launching a conventional war under the um, the aegis of, of of a nuclear strike capability, and that's the same reason why Iran is pursuing uh, a nuclear weapon. It's so that they can launch conventional wars against their neighbors, like uh, you know, certain you know, within Iraq and against Saudi Arabia, against Israel, and and to feel that they can do that with impunity. They can launch robust terrorist proxy wars or conventional wars in the region without worrying that they're going to be directly um, uh, retaliated against uh, if they have nuclear weapons. So I, I, I worry about uh, that lesson being drawn from the current conflict that countries are going to look to acquire nuclear weapons uh, to avoid either avoid being a Ukraine or on the other side so that they can do the things that aggressive dictators like to do. Um, Saddam Hussein, when he was pursuing a nuke in, uh, in you know, the 1980s, um, we captured his, uh, his NSC notes, by the way. They're not, they're not classified anymore. I don't know how you'd get your hands on them, but I read through a lot of it, that, those papers when I was a Marine. Um, it, when you look at his NSC notes from the 1980s when he was fighting against Iran and he was pursuing a nuclear arm, uh, you know, a nuclear weapons capability, his vision was to be able to launch conventional wars against Israel and against Iran and other neighbors without having, and to do it with impunity uh, if, if he had a nuclear uh, capability. So th these are the sorts of things we need to guard against. We, we wanna extend the great streak that we've had since the end of World War II in um, limiting the number of nuclear weapon states to single digits uh, today, as far as we know, it's a single digit number. Um, I, think, I think there's, there's a, a strong, um, imperative for us to try to keep that streak alive and not let this genie uh, get out of the bottle and start spreading horizontally. Great, thank you. I think we have time for one or, or two more questions. Um, there was a question that came in from someone from Taiwan, uh, which I wanted to ask about um, so-called strategic ambiguity um, and that strategy historically in the United States. Um, some experts have called for an end to strategic ambiguity, while the Biden administration seems hesitant to do so. The Taiwanese people uh, were appreciative of the steps the Trump administration took to fortify relations with, ta with Taiwan. Um, but as friendly as President Trump was, he didn't take the ultimate step of ending strategic ambiguity. I wonder about your views on the future of strategic ambiguity and the plausibility of a U.S. intervention into potential Taiwan-China conflict. Yeah. So I, first, I think it's, it, it is very important for China, um, uh, you know, that we need to reduce the chance for miscalculation by Xi Jinping, which is not easy to do. He doesn't listen to his diplomats. His diplomats um, uh, only transmit. They don't receive or, or pass up information anymore. Um, uh, he doesn't, he doesn't meet with foreigners uh, other than uh, Vladimir Putin uh, uh, once, once in a blue moon. Um, but we need nonetheless to work hard to try to, uh, to compress the, um, uh, the, you know, the odds for a grave miscalculation on his part. And so, so there is an argument for, uh, for um, lifting the, uh, you know, turning away from what we call strategic ambiguity. I, I actually think the more important thing to do, and a thing that, that would um, uh, really do a lot more than any kind of rhetorical shift would be um, to show that, you know, carry a big stick, a bigger stick um, uh, to that area, help Taiwan acquire a bigger stick and learn how to use it rapidly uh, and, uh, and to help Japan and, and Australia uh, as well. We need to be doing tabletop exercises and real world exercises involving all four of those partners. And we need to have started yesterday on that. But I, I think capability will speak um, much more loudly to Beijing than uh, any changes in our rhetorical posture. Uh, President Biden has said on, on a couple of occasions uh, that, that, uh, the United, that you know, he will defend Taiwan. Um, now, imagine if that statement was backed by um, uh, credible power uh, in the form of mobile, um, redundant, distributed anti-ship and anti-air missiles across the first island chain, including in Taiwan, uh, and, and other capabilities of that nature. We, we've really got to rush this stuff forward right now. Um, so, yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. And um, I think this will be probably our, our last question before we wrap for today. Uh, Laura is asking, could Matt comment on the significance of Xi's cultural, cultural crackdown in China arresting uh, movie stars like uh, Fan Bing, criticizing the dress and lifestyle of uh, young movie stars restricting youth online access is the motive trying to decouple China from Western cultural influences. Yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, this is uh, something strong men do. <laughs> they, they, you know, uh, Xi Jinping is obsessed with the effeminization of of uh, Chinese culture, and so he's, uh, you know, he he's he started banning. Um, male movie stars who don't look sufficiently uh, like, you know, socialist realist, uh, you know, sculptures. <laughs> he's, he's uh, you know, they're, they're editing the TV show Friends so that there are no references uh, to uh, gay characters uh, in, in film and in, in sitcoms. You know, th we've seen this before. We've seen this, we've seen this with fascist regimes uh, in particular. Um, some, some people have been arguing uh, that China has gone so far left under Xi Jinping that it's actually come all the way around to a far right sort of fascist uh, militarist kind of dictatorship. Um, there's room, there's room uh, to argue both sides of that. Um, but this is, this is part and parcel of, uh, of, uh, of a totalitarian ideology under a, a paranoid but ambitious uh, dictator like we have in, in Xi Jinping. Um, well, Matt, uh, thank you so much. We always like to end uh, a little before the hour to give our audience time to, to get to their next events. But I just want to say we greatly appreciate your being here for a uh, very interesting uh, and lively discussion. And we, uh, we appreciate the time. I also want to thank our audience members uh, for being here today and participating uh, in this series on the future of conservative foreign policy. Um, and we, we do hope that you'll continue to, to join us for our other sessions. Um, over the course of the coming weeks and months um, and as we explore sort of what is the future of conservative foreign policy uh, in the next few years. So Matt, thank you so much. We, we greatly appreciate the, the conversation and on a, on a number of topics. And I'm sure this is just the beginning of looking into many of these issues. So thank Thanks, you. Thanks, Amanda. It's great to be with you. Yep. Keep thank up you. the great work.